Hey there, YouTubers! Hi there, Dr. Sheeper! Welcome back to the astronomy video! That's been a while, and this is my second take because there's a light right here that was in the shot. I am an idiot. Anyways, this is a, this is the first of a four-part series on our solar United system. Ours. In we live here. We. Ours. Will Share it. Communist. <laughs> Anyways, this four-part series will cover the sun and stars in general, the inner and outer planets, finally dwarf planets, and in that video we'll briefly discuss exoplanets. For today, I'm going to do a brief overview of our solar system, what the sun is, and uh, how stars work, how stars are classified, and then finally their life cycles. Now, I have done a video on stars before, but things have changed since that video was made. For one thing, our subscriber count has almost, if not doubled, so give ourselves a round of applause, pat myself on the back, pat, pat Phil on the back, everything. Also, the world is much more terrifying now, which I didn't even think that was possible, <laughs> but it is. And I have changed, so it's always a good thing. So a reboot is a good thing, usually. And I would like to thank the Reverend for giving me the idea to make a series on the planets. I actually had kind of wanted to for a while, but he gave me that final shove I needed. If you don't know who the Reverend is, you can watch the podcast where we talk about him and read his comments. You know what's practically a carcinogen? The yeah. universe. <laughs> I'm cancerous. Which is around 13.8 billion years old. The universe, not Phil. <laughs> Our sun is around 4.5 billion years old. There are eight and main Phil planets. Phil is around 13 years. I am filming here, Phil. M main planets and numerous dwarf planets. There, mm, there are eight main planets and numerous dwarf planets in our solar system. Around five. The planets are divided into main, into two main sections, and the dwarf planets are are a subcategory. The inner planets, in order of from distance from the Sun, are Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. The inner and outer planets are separated by a ring of asteroids that surround the Sun. This area is called the Asteroid Belt. What a great name, right? <laughs> Kinda hits you on the nose. The outer planets, in order from distance from the Sun, are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. All or <clears throat> all of which are gas giants, which means they don't actually have a surface you can practically walk on, but more on that in the future videos. Once you move past Neptune, you enter the Kuiper Belt, and eventually the Oort Cloud. These areas are similar to the Asteroid Belt, and are filled with natural space debris. Beyond that, you're entering, the, you're entering interstellar space, the area between stars. do ba do ba do ba do Our sun, like all stars, are... <laughs> all star are large collections of dust and gas that give that have been squeezed together by gravity. As gravity pulls the dust and gas together tighter and tighter, heat and pressure begins to be, begin to increase. This forces atoms to get closer and closer together. The majority of the universe is comprised of hydrogen, which is the lightest element on the periodic table. The atoms get pulled together so close that two atoms can become one, releasing a lot of energy. This is a process called fusion, and it powers all stars in the universe. A good question is, why does fusion release energy? Well, this energy comes from the equation E equals mc squared, and the conservation of mass, which, <clears throat> and the conservation of mass. When isotopes of hydrogen that contain one neutron and two neutrons fuse, they create helium, which has only two neutrons. So, to conserve mass, energy is released. You can learn more from my series on energy. This energy causes an outward force on the star, and gravity is constantly trying to pull it back in. Stars are constantly keeping these factors balanced, perfectly balanced, like all things should be. However, when these factors become unbalanced, the star begins to die. Kaboom. Not always. All right. I don't know what the rest of the words are. <laughs> so what? I just went back and watched my original star video, and I would have to admit, 
I didn't do that bad of a job. Give myself a pat on the back. I was pretty impressed. I completely forgot I tried to pull some Carl Sagan stuff. So that was interesting to say the least. Well, since then, I have kind of lost the inspiration. I'm not burned out, just not inspired like I used to be. Also, because I ran out of time to write this script. So don't cry if this isn't like the original, which none of you watched. It is getting steamy in here, I will say that. <clears throat> A lot of things have changed, as I mentioned earlier, specifically my knowledge of the star classification system. But one thing, Phil introduced me to new star classes. But for what you would need to know in school, just remember O B A F G K M, or be a fine girl, kiss me. Girl can be substituted for whatever you'd like. Anything that starts with the letter G anyways, so don't. Oh, you thought I was going to say guy, didn't you? Well, we do things for the meme here, so. Anyway, this classification works well for stars in their main sequence, and we'll get to that later. But for star-like objects and white dwarfs, these classifications don't work. But how do the classification systems work anyway? Well, originally they were solely based off brightness. All of our stars' brightness changes with age, so it's not going to work. Then they tried solely spectral lines, but this doesn't work either because cooler stars and brighter stars can give off the same lines. This is due to the fact that cooler stars can't excite the atoms around them, and so therefore no spectral lines are produced. Hot, st super hot stars are too hot and strip the electrons away from these atoms, and so again, no light is produced, thus no spectrum lines. Whoop. Don't need that anymore. You can probably still see it. <laughs> Anyways, if you're unfamiliar with spectrum lines, I'll give a brief explanation. White light is comprised of all the colors of the rainbow, and when light is shined through a triangular glass prism, you can see those colors. When the correct setup is used, you can see lines in the spectrum. These lines are specific to each individual element. Each element, when excited with energy, will show a specific line. Woo! Let's have some fun with the weird star classifications. Okay, so if spectrum lines in brightness doesn't work, what are you supposed to do? Now, stars are classified using a combination of lum luminosity and temperature which is calculated using the spectrum lines. Now, O stars are the hottest, and M's are the coolest. This is not including the newer classes I'm going to talk about later. Each letter can then be broken down into numbers, 0 to 9, 9 being the hottest and 0 being the coolest under each of these specific class letters. Then, Roman numerals are added to dictate what part of the stellar life cycle they are in. IA plus is used for hypergiants, I for Super Giants, II Captain for Bright Giants, I Triple I for Regular Giants, IV for Sub Giants, V for Main Sequence, and SD or VI uh, for White Dwarfs. Okay, so there are other classes that have been added. All right, they're there. W class stars are O class stars, but the difference is complicated and you can read the wiki article below. L class stars are large enough to support hydrogen fusion, thus a star, but are cooler than M class. T class stars are exclusively brown dwarfs. Even cooler brown dwarfs are classified as Y. Why? I don't know. C class stars are giant are red giants whose atmospheres are mostly carbon. S-class stars fill the space between C and M-class stars. Why, hello there. I have my fun fact book. I'm in my fun fact chair. That means it's time for a fun fact. Today's fun fact is quite short and simple. Our sun is a G2V-class star, meaning it's a class G. It's 2, which means it's cooler of a G-class star, and it's V, meaning it's in a main sequence. Isn't that just fascinating? Finally, the life cycle of stars. Stars start out in giant gas and dust clouds called nebulae, or singular nebula. 
A nebula can be huge, spanning light years across, and the way the sun and the way the light dances with the dust particles looks beautiful. Here are some pictures. The biggest of these are referred to as stellar nurseries. Thanks to computer simulations, it turns out stars have a habit of forming in groups of two or three, and as they age, they spread out. Stars that have yet to generate strong enough solar winds to blow away their nursery dust are called protostars. These protostars are violent celestial objects and are very unstable. As they age, they stabilize and become the stars we know and love. Just like fine wine, the more age, the better. After the protostar stage, they move into main sequence, where they will live for some stars only a relatively short amount of time before they begin to die. The larger the star, the shorter the lifetime, and the more spectacular the death. M-class stars are born and then just use up their fuel over billions and billions of years and slowly die. Gs and higher go through other stages. K, G, and F-class stars, as they age and the hydrogen in their cores is used up, they swell into a red giant. The red color comes from the cooling of these of those outer layers. As the star runs out of helium to use, it fuses carbon. This doesn't release enough energy, and the star sloughs its outer layers and makes a planetary nebula. At the center is what we call a white dwarf. At this point, uh, fusion has all but stopped, and the carbon core can now cool over trillions of years. O, B, and A class stars don't create planetary nebulae. There used to be a time I was all she ever wanted. Oh, the man that she'd ever need. Then I come home to find just like that she's up and vanished. The only thing she left behind for me are O, B, and A class stars. <clears throat> These stars are heavy enough to keep fusing past carbon all the way up to iron. Fusing iron doesn't release more energy than it does to create it, and so the star loses the battle with gravity, and the core of the star collapses, releasing a massive amount of energy called a supernova. These are some of the most energetic events in the cosmos. These supernovae are so powerful, they produce the other missing elements on the table that stars simply can't produce. Uh, uh, that stars simply can't fuse, like lithium or uranium. What remains after the supernova depends on the mass of the star. Less massive stars will leave behind something called a neutron star. A neutron star is the densest material, uh, the densest matter in the universe. The only thing preventing the object from collapsing are the neutrons repelling each other. Think about that. If stars are too massive, no force in the universe can keep them from collapsing to a single point, called a singularity. Looks nice, doesn't it? At the center of a black hole, we have the singularity, which is effectively a hole in space-time. It's a three-dimensional hole, which is almost, if not impossible, to even picture in your head. The event horizon is the edge of a black hole. This is where the pull of gravity is so strong that not even light can escape. Funny thing about black holes is that before the event horizon, there is a point where the orbital velocity is the speed of light. At this point, you could theoretically see the back of your head. However, as I said, this orbit is very unstable, and the photons tend to just fall right into the black hole. Not to mention you would need to go the speed of light, which is impossible thanks to a variable you traditionally can't see in the equation equals mc squared. Uh, it's called gamma. If you want to learn more, ask Phil in the comments, and he can explain it. So hashtag at Phil or whatever the hell. Um, or, and he'll either answer them right there or in the next podcast. If you were paying attention, you may have noticed 
that it takes the death of another star to create the elements we use every day. We are actually stardust, which is humbling to think we are but a small part of the universe. Also, the Bible did get something right. We did come from dust. Anyways, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe. New videos every other Friday, 2 p.m. Central Time, and good night. Camera sunscreen! Camera sunscreen! Traces of uranium. But why does it need <laughs> trace amounts of lead? <laughs> There would be trace amounts of lead. Should, I, should we mention that this uh, sunscreen is highly carcinogenic? <laughs> highly? Uh, it is a carcinogen. <laughs> it, it is practically a carcinogen. Subs for trees. Subs for trees. Subs for trees. Subs for trees. Oh, you're still here? I thought I told you to go home. Oh, you want more? I'm flattered. Check out the playlist. If you want exclusive content, check out my Instagram, doctor underscore sheep underscore YouTube. That's all lowercase. If you want to help the earth, subscribe. When I reach 100 subscribers, I'm going to plant 10 trees. If you feel that's too small, then check out my channel trail where I lay out even bigger goals. Finally, stick around for the next 20 seconds and give me that sweet watch time. Bye.